Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so very much for coming. My name is Arthur Millick. I'm the executive director of the Claremont Institute Center for the American Way of Life here in Washington, DC. Uh, the right has gone through, let's say three phases over the past uh, 10 years. First, it was laughter at the left, laughing, thinking that this or that policy, this or that outrage can be solved just with laughter. That steadily turned in to a kind of hopelessness when one saw how pervasive everything was that we were laughing at. Um, and the hopelessness led to a kind of dejection that has only been rehabilitated. And I think that that's what everybody in this room shares, which is uh, a new, a renewed, a new seriousness that I haven't seen in my lifetime uh, about uh, engaging in politics in a way that isn't just about marketing and advertising, but is about owning institutions. Uh, the book that we're partly here to discuss, to celebrate, is a book that was put together by a lot of writers, some of whom are in this audience, that maps out the right's errors over the last generation, point by point, issue by issue. Uh, the right is not good, in many ways, at doing autopsies on itself, uh, looking at itself in the mirror and looking at its own losses. Uh, if a corporation doesn't learn from its mistakes, it goes out of business. If a doctor doesn't learn from his mistakes and his patients get hurt, he loses his license and goes out of business. Take that analogy to every single profession. It applies everywhere, except for the establishment right. Nobody is ever punished. Only the country suffers on account of it. Uh, on immigration, on universities, on the administrative state, on various funding programs that fund uh, the right's enemies directly, uh, nothing ever seems to change no matter how hard you vote. And in a moment when the left uh, possesses nearly all of the major institutional powers in the country, much of the right pretends like it's still business as usual. It's not. Sometimes a, a country uh, or a party can lose uh, and never recover itself once and for all. And we always forget that. But things it feels are changing in the air. You feel it. Uh, and it's thanks to some of the people in this room. A lot of people in DC, when you when you uh, confront them with the bad situation in the country, with the almost total institutional control uh, of the left, say, well, you still have to hope. Uh, fair enough, it's bad to be without hope and simply be pessimistic, but it's also a vice, it can be a vice, uh, in that it implies that something, somewhere, will rescue you eventually. Uh, and that may not be true. You may be the ones, or your representatives, serious political people may be the ones that rescue you. Uh, from the situation. Uh, I would like to uh, quickly introduce um, one of our special guests here, Senator J.D. Vance. Unlike a lot of uh, Republicans, he doesn't forget where he came from uh, and who he's here for. Uh, may Yale one day revoke his degree because he's been so effective. <laughs> he's the most intelligent and thoughtful U.S. Senator and the only one set on actually restraining the power of the left uh, nationally. Uh, please welcome Senator J.D. Vance. Thanks, Arthur, and uh, good to see everybody. Uh, I was told because we're in the Capitol's uh, Visitor Center that I cannot encourage anyone to purchase this book. I can only say that it's very well done, and uh, it has great, great seeds of wisdom. Uh, purchase it if you would like to, but don't purchase it if you would not like to. But uh, congratulations on such a great... Uh, on such a great book and uh, thanks for getting such a good crew together. Obviously, many of you are my friends, uh, people who I've listened to uh, and debated with for many years as we try to figure out how to save the country. You know, I, I, I thought what I could do here that would be most useful is actually offer some uh, practical insights into what I've actually seen being in government nearly a year now. We talk a lot about how to fix Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been doing the very practical work for the past year of, of trying to figure out what that actually means and how to put it into practice. And so I thought that I'd offer just a few observations here. Uh, and then um, I know we are running a little short on time, but if you guys want to ask me a few questions afterwards, I'll try to be relatively brief here. Um, Wells, who's my uh, great, great staffer and uh, has uh, prepared these incredible remarks, is going to be disappointed in me because I never actually look at my remarks as they're prepared. Uh, I just kind of say whatever I think. And so uh, that hasn't got me into too much trouble yet. Uh, it's, I guess it's got me here, so maybe it has gotten me into a fair amount of trouble. But uh, here, here, here goes. So, so three, three broad insights I'd like to leave you with as I uh, have been a U.S. senator for all of a year now, uh, not even quite a year. Um, the the first is that I think that 
you know, those of us, you call it, it's called the new right. And I think it's called the new right because those of us in the conservative movement are trying to do something new with the old institutions, something new with the old ideas and something new with the old tradition of, of American conservative failure. And I hate to say it, uh, but that is the defining inheritance of American conservatism for the, for the past 30 years. It has been that we have largely failed at the goals that we have set out to accomplish. Uh, I, like a lot of American conservatives, pay a great amount of attention to what goes across the pond in the United Kingdom. And I, I, I try to th ask myself, uh, Margaret Thatcher was a very successful prime minister electorally, but is there a single thing that Margaret Thatcher actually fought for that has proven successful in 2023 Britain? Or if you go back to the Reagan revolution in the 1980s and asked, what is it that you want, if you ask the voters, what is it that you want out of this presidency? Uh, did any of it actually succeed? Uh, maybe the enduring legacy of Ronald Reagan's tenure in Washington was the 1986 immigration reform, which set about the greatest uh, change in American immigration policy in a generation. And the consequences of it we're still feeling today. The consequences of it, by the way, have turned multiple red states blue and I think have transformed our country in very profound ways. That's not a criticism of Ronald Reagan, who I think was genuinely a great president. Uh, it's a criticism of the approach of the conservative movement which I think has been structurally flawed for a very long time. How is it that we keep on winning elections and keep on losing the country's most important battles? Uh, that's something that we have to be honest with ourselves and not just sort of point to the past and say, these are great people. Many of them were great people, but many of them failed despite being great people. And I think if we want to succeed where they failed, it will require us to think about those failures in, in new ways. The first thing that I've learned, having been a senator for all of a year, is that we need to remember who we serve. Um, we get way too abstract. I think all of us here are mostly pretty smart people. Uh, we care a lot about ideas. We read things like the American mind or up from conservatism. And we think and care a lot about the life of the mind. But most of the people that we represent and most of the people that we serve, uh, they're human beings. They're worried about really important things like raising their children or figuring out how to pay the mortgage, which quite frankly, uh, thanks to the Biden administration's policies, has gotten a lot harder uh, in the last few months. What the people that we're serving are very, very different, even from the think tank intellectuals that we th sort of think of, of uh, as aligned here in Washington, D.C. In fact, they're very different from the think tank intellectuals that we think of as aligned here in Washington, D.C. So I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of people who work in this town, their instinct is to sort of view them as this distant group of people. And yet, it is the American Constitution that gives those people the power to decide what our government ultimately looks like. Um, we've got to know who we're actually represented. They're, they're not conservatives primarily of the mind because, like I said, they've got more important things going on. But they are conservatives of the heart. Uh, they love the country. They love the community that they came from. They don't see this place as some distant, um, abstract set of ideas. They see it as the place where their grandfathers or their great grandfathers set down roots where they built a business, where they've tried to build community. Uh, that doesn't make them, in my view, unsophisticated. What it does is it makes them actually wise because they realize that this country is not primarily about the ideas that bounce around the minds of intellectuals and of senators and of Congress people. They realize that this country is about the lived experiences, to borrow a term from the left, of the people who actually occupy it. We shouldn't be afraid of that word, by the way. The lived experiences of the people that we represent uh, are, are, I think, where the greatest source of strength that our movement actually comes from. When I, when I was first elected, it was sort of a crazy thing that happened. I was very much in new senator mode. I was still figuring out where the, where the hell all the doors were, right? You had no idea where to go around it. Uh, my credit to Jamal Bowman for uh, showing us all where one of the most important <laughs> exits were in, in, in these buildings. But you know, I, I still all kidding aside, had no idea how to get around this building. And yet uh, we had this terrible train crash in East Palestine, Ohio. And uh, you all saw the mushroom cloud, the chemicals burning and so forth. And there were two sort of very quick insights that I gleaned from spending so much time in East Palestine. Um, the first is that this is a town that the train crash was really bad, but East Palestine had been left behind by this country for 40 or 50 years. It had suffered terribly from waves and deindustrialization. There were people there who were trying to figure out how to piece back together their community, how to create wealth and create jobs and opportunity in East Palestine, Ohio. This train crash was just another in a long line of, of uh, leadership that kicked these people in the teeth. Uh, it was bad, and I don't mean to, to understate it, 
but it was it was it was a it came as part of a long line of really bad things that had happened in East Palestine, Ohio. If you had visited it the day before the train crash, you would have said, this is a community that has been left behind by policymakers in Washington, D.C. And indeed, it had been left behind by policymakers in Washington, D.C. Now, the second thing I learned is that after the train crash, it's quite shocking how much public policy in this town is driven by lobbyists. I mean, we talk about this all the time. But in reality, when you try to do something to help the people of East Palestine, Ohio, there are 10 layers of lobbyists, 10 layers of bureaucracy, and then 10 layers of, of idiots on top of that. So 30 layers that you have to deal with before you can actually get the people of East Palestine any help. Uh, I, I actually heard from Republican congressmen, Republican senators, and by the way, remember that most of the rail lines in our country go through less densely populated areas, the very types of areas that we represent here in the Republican Party. And I heard repeatedly that if we did anything to try to call the railroads to account, if we tried to do anything to make it less likely that trains would crash and set off chemical bombs in our communities, that we were somehow violating sacred tenets of conservatism. Well, I think the sacred tenet of conservatism is to remember who we serve and to defend the people who actually make our communities what they are, not to defend railroad companies, by the way, many of whom were donating hundreds of thousands of dollars to Democrats in the run-up uh, to the election of 2022, many of whom have actively leaned into the most left-wing take on the culture wars over the last two decades. Is it really our job to defend the railroads and not the people who had a chemical explosion shut off in their community? If that's your attitude about what's going on in this country, then I think that you've got a very screwed up notion of American conservatism. Remember who we serve. We are elected to do a job. Of course, most importantly, to uphold the constitution of this country. And after that, to do something meaningful for the people who elected us. Don't forget that. And don't forget the people who actually gave us that power in the first place. Now on that, the second insight I want to leave you with is Republicans, conservatives, we're still terrified of wielding power, of actually doing the job that the people sent us here to do. You heard Arthur say this earlier, that so many of the institutions have been captured by the left. How many of us have been worried about this problem? that the media, the financial institutions, some of our biggest corporations, the technology sector, and the censorship that comes along with it, uh, and of course, the universities and um, the institutions of education have been captured by the left, some of them for generations in this country. And yet, the one thing that our voters can actually get, the one institution that our voters can actually win in this country is when they go and vote and elect Republicans. And then when they elect Republicans, what do all of us say? We all say we don't think the government should do anything. How, how is that anything other than a lose-lose proposition for the people who sent us? If on the one hand, you have nearly every major and powerful cultural and financial institution in this country aligned with the left, and on the other hand, you occasionally have the people's democratic government that answers to the right, why shouldn't we be doing something? with the people's elected government when they give us the opportunity to do so, right? Isn't it, make common, isn't it just common sense that when we're given power, we should actually do something with it? I hear this all the time in critiques of the administrative state that come from the American conservative movement. And a lot of the critiques, of course, I agree with. The administrative state is too big. It does do too much. It is really hard. I mean, I, I was an investor and a business guy before I got into politics. Try to build something in this country and run into the layers of NEPA certifications and environmental regulations that have nothing to do with protecting the environment, but they have a lot to do with employing bureaucrats. Our critiques of the administrative state are very often correct, but our answer to this can't be every single time the American people give us power, the only thing that we try to do is to trim down the thing that they gave us control over. Sometimes we ought to say, you know, instead of just trimming this thing down, why don't we actually make it more responsive to the will of the people? The most, in my view, the most egregious and out of control part of the deep state in this country is the Department of Justice. The leadership of the Department of Justice is actively prosecuting its political opponents. I'm not just talking about Donald Trump, of course. Uh, we know that Douglas Mackey is, is, is almost at, at the brink of, being ser of serving prison time. I understand that a federal court stepped in and prevented him from going to prison. Why? For posting a meme, for posting a joke. Merrick Garland is trying to throw this guy in prison for what, close to a year because he posted a joke on the internet. And yet, 
our response to this is, is, as far as I can tell, that we should have the Department of Justice doing less. Well, I agree it should be doing less, but maybe it should actually do something good too. Maybe we should actually be appointing attorneys at the Department of Justice who investigate the corruption in our own government. Maybe we should be appointing people at the Department of Justice who actually take a side in the culture war, the side of the people who elected us, and not just pretend we don't have to take sides at all. This is crazy to me. Every single time the American people give us an opportunity, we tell them we don't deserve the opportunity. We just want to make this thing smaller. We should be much more focused on making it responsive to the will of the people. I know there are a lot of uh, articles in this book about that very topic, but we've got to get comfortable with wielding power. That's, that's something our voters is, expect of us. Uh, I remember a conversation I was having uh, with a guy after a campaign rally. It was more of a town hall. Uh, in, in, in the early days of my uh, Republican primary campaign, uh, this was probably summer of 2021, and I gave this sort of thunderous speech against big tech, and I argued, we've got to stop the technology oligarchs from censoring American conservatives. We've got to be willing to break these companies up, use the Teddy Roosevelt option. They're too big, they're too powerful, and if they're preventing conservatives from participating meaningfully in the public debate, we've got to be willing to use power to stop them, to stop that power and to push back in the other direction. And I remember this guy came up and it was a very nice suit uh, afterwards. He came up uh, in, his, in his nice suit and it was, it was clear that he was a guy of, of, of high credentials and good education, probably had a very nice job. And, and, he, and he, he said, I really agreed with everything that you said, but I, I had to push back with what you said about the technology companies. I was like, oh no, here we go. This is a, a David French critique that these are private companies, right? We can't do anything to the technology companies because they are private companies. We should let the market decide what is censored and what is part of our public debate. And he said, look, why, why do you want to break these companies up? Why don't we just throw all their CEOs in prison? <laughs> <laughs> My point is that our voters are much, much more willing to invest us with the ability to do something. And frankly, a lot of them are willing to go much further than even I'm willing to go. And I'm, I'm probably willing to go much further than pretty much anybody else in this building. My point is the voters, when they give us power, we have to be willing to wield it. This is not a high class debating society. This is the United States Congress, and it ought to actually respond to the people who give it all of its authority. The third point that I want to make here is uh, we have to be less ideological. What do I mean by that? Again, I, I sort of point this out. Many of us are conservatives of the mind. We read things like Hayek and Arthur Millick and all these other geniuses that are in this, in this, in this uh, volume. We think a lot about how to apply principles from 250 years ago to the problems of 2023. But in, 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 the, in the experience that I've had as a U.S. Senator, so much of what's going on in our movement is a pure question of who is going to help us accomplish our goals and who is trying to hurt us to accomplish our goals. And if somebody's going to help us accomplish our goals, we ought to be willing to make common calls with them and go and get something done. Let me just highlight this in a couple of ways. So, so what are the dumbest debates that's going on in the new right? I mean, the, the, the people that I consider my closest friends in the American conservative movement is whether we should be pro or anti-union, okay? And there are people who sort of point to the old libertarian arguments and say the unions are fundamentally instruments of the left. They distort the market in all these ways, and we should be anti-union because to be anti-union is to be pro-people and pro-conservatism. And then you have sort of these newfangled conservatives, a lot of whom are my friends who say, look, unions are a place where the common people, the common people who have been dispossessed by our elites can actually come together and acquire some bargaining power. We should be, we should be supporting unions for that purpose. And to both of them, I say, sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong, right? Sometimes unions serve very useful functions and sometimes they don't. And why, why do we have to be so ideological about this? Why don't we just be realistic, get out of the abstractions and into the real world? Here's a union I really like, because um, this is another thing conservatives will say, well, you know, I, I like unions, but I really hate public sector unions. You know what union I really like? The Fraternal Order of Police, a public sector union. And you know why I like the Fraternal Order of Police is because they are the most powerful institution in our society, standing between barbarism. When people burn down buildings and loot and murder, it is the police that prevent them from doing so, and it's the fraternal order police that ensures they don't lose their job for doing their job. They don't lose their livelihoods for doing their job. They don't go to prison for doing their job. 
That's why I like the Fraternal Order Police. I don't give a damn what abstract arguments you give against public sector unions. I like people who stand on the line between civilization and barbarians. It's that simple. And you should too. I'm telling you right now that in the actual world of politics that we live, the people who are doing the most to ensure the criminals don't take over our cities are maybe the police and the people who represent them. So don't give me your crap about public sector unions. The fraternal order of police are the good guys and conservatives should be fighting for them because we believe in civilization. We believe in beauty. We believe you should be able to walk down the street without getting mugged or murdered. And that's why we support the cops. Let me give you another example. Um, I, uh, I had a meeting where I think the leader uh, who, who met with me was not very well briefed. I won't, I won't name his name because I don't want to embarrass the guy, but you know, he came into my office it was very early during my Senate term. He was one of the leaders of the major American airlines. And he said, Senator, I, I just want you to know that we're very committed to the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our flying uh, workforce. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, whoever, whichever staffer prepared you for this meeting, they should get fired because you were, you were, you were not talking to the right guy, my friend. But he said, he said something really, really interesting to me. He said that um, they really want to diversify uh, the pilot workforce. They would really like to increase uh, the number of young people that they have uh, working as pilots. And that sounds pretty good to me. But then he said that there are actually people that he would like to be pilots and he thinks they would actually make excellent pilots, but they don't satisfy the standards that have been set to become pilots, okay? And I'm the father of three kids, a six-year-old, a three-year-old, a one-year-old. There are two jobs that I really, really want to be merit-based and nothing else. One is surgeons and two is airline pilots, okay? I want the smartest and the best people. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what their background is. And the thing this guy said to me is, 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 is actually, if you think about it, I would like to have less qualified people flying your children around in the name of diversity. That's insane. I, whatever my politics are, I'm against that. I want the most qualified people to be flying the children of Americans all across our country. Now, you know what else he said to me that was pretty interesting? Is that the people who were standing in his way, and I think this is where he sort of thought, maybe I was just a, a conventional Republican, he said, the people who were standing in his way the people who are most aggressively preventing him from hiring a more diverse workforce within the pilot corps were the airline unions. Okay. I didn't know shit about the airline unions. And then I be became their biggest fan that moment. Okay. Again, I'm not talking about abstractions. I'm not talking about Hayekian arguments about uh, bargaining power and workers. I'm talking about the people who want to make sure we have the most qualified pilots. Those are my people. And I'm going to be on their side going forward. And in each of these arguments, if you really think about it, we got to get less abstract and we got to focus on the things that actually matter. So my third and final point that I will leave you with, and I'll repeat it, is stop caring so much about ideas. Ideas really matter, but start caring about how we can win and the alliances that we have to form in order to win. I will be as much of an ally as I can be, and I know you guys will reciprocate. God bless you and your efforts. Thank you. And okay, um, so uh, if you have a question, I'll take like two or three questions. Just speak loudly. I'll answer them quickly, and then I'll get out of here. Unless you guys get on with the rest of the conference. Anybody? Mike Anton has a lot to say. Mike, you have a question? <laughs> Anybody? Question in the back, please, sir. Be loud. Uh, fraternal order of police, as well as the airline unions, in cases where they were absolutely correct. Now, I would assume that I know your answer on this, but in cases where those unions are wrong, you're not going to, they're only your people on a case-by-case -case basis, correct? Look, it's, it, that's exactly right. I think that there are good unions and there are bad unions. We have to be honest about that fact. Do I, do I have a, a special amount of affection uh, for the, the Starbucks baristas union uh, where they're currently using their power not to bargain for higher wages, uh, but to come out and support the terrorists of Hamas, right? But this is what I mean about getting too abstract about this stuff. And the criticism I would, I would give to my friends on the right who tend to be more pro-union is if your politics lead you to defend the baristas union as they defend Hamas, then you should have a different politics. It's really that simple. Again, some of these institutions are good. Some of these institutions are bad. And the only way you can really figure it out is to do the work, get on the ground, meet with people, try to create alliances and figure out how it goes from there. Sir, in the back. Uh, so, uh, first, with your second point, sure. Uh, we certainly enjoy the work that you 
Um, but does it not still matter the precise things that we do? So, for example, with the, the tech companies, yes, the tech companies were involved in the censorship, but we now have pretty definitive proof that this all came from the DOJ at some level. So do you think it might be a mistake to turn our ire on the private sector when they have the sort of Damocles of regulation hanging over them all the time and it does come from the deep state on some level, um, even though our results in the past going after the deep state have been disappointing? Well, it's it's I, I think the on some level part of your question is really important, right? It came from the deep state on some level. We certainly know that the FBI was was explicitly participating in some of the censorship regime in the run up to the 2020 election. But look, we also know these guys were doing it in part on of their own volition. The FBI wasn't making Mark Zuckerberg write four hundred twenty five million dollars to left wing ballot harvesting initiatives. Right. Uh, my, 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 my point here, again, to go back to the abstraction point uh, is we have to recognize good versus evil, right versus wrong, and not allow a particular principle to hamstring us from doing what's actually in the, the interest uh, of the American people. Because if, you know, as, as, as Anton Chigurh says, uh, if, if, if the rule has led you to this point, at what use was the rule? Okay. My point is, if the rule has led us to that point, we have to be willing to think of some different rules to apply here. And you're absolutely right. We have to be mindful of the deep state. Uh, on the censorship stuff, if I would sort of allot responsibility, I'd probably say 70% of it was deep state, 30% of it was private actor. That's a guess in my head, but that means that we have to be willing to sort of push back on both fronts if we actually want to end the censorship complex in this country, uh, and I certainly do. One more question, sir. Yeah, uh, your comments kind of remind me of uh, Carl Schmidt's idea that uh, politics is about who's the enemy. <laughs> um, well, look, um, I'm, I'm hardly an expert in Carl Schmidt, uh, and I actually am pretty ecumenical in that I think that most of our fellow Americans are not the enemy. I think it's really important that we distinguish between the leadership of the left and the rank and file Democratic voter, I think most of whom uh, actually, I, I genuinely do believe this, I'm not just a, a hopeless optimist, I think most rank and file Democrats are pretty good people. Uh, I think the leadership of the left has gone completely insane. And certainly when I'm talking about restoring civic order, bringing back a meaningful border, raising the wages of Americans, um, just bringing back like the basic good things that we all care about in the conservative movement, uh, then certainly there are people on the left that are actively aligned against it. And I'm not afraid to call them out for that, for that fact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Arthur. Uh, thanks for organizing. Uh, God bless you guys, and I hope to see you all soon. See ya.